stand up for yourself And I'll back you up Cause problems don't solve themselves I'll tell you what Instead of would or could I think you should Draw a line in the sand and stand your ground It's for your own good Hello, my name is Roy Poyan, and I want to welcome you to another episode of The Voice of Families and Addiction. Today we're going to continue our series on reentry. And reentry, I just want to remind everybody, could be um, reentry from a treatment center back into your life. It could be reentry, and most commonly used phrase uh, from incarceration, and you've now been given parole, and, and you're, you're, you're living your life uh, outside of a facility, um, although in many cases in the beginning you're, you're under constraints of the authority of, of the body that had you originally incarcerated, so you're living by their policies, procedures, and rules. Um, Reentry might be from um, other types of more isolated events. It could be a mental health residential. Uh, so when we start to look at this, this material that we're reviewing, and that is the uh, reentry curriculum done uh, in Arizona. It's a student handbook of the title Merging Two Worlds. And, and that is exactly what we're doing here. Uh, we're going through a series of different like instructions and practical exercises and in some cases new aware awarenesses. In others, it's a complement to what you already know. Um, kind of like, well, I know about beliefs, I know about values. But now what we've done is we've, we've more made that personal and yours. So it's defined more not just as values, it's your values. You might say it's my values, it's my beliefs. And that's exactly the way we would like for you to look at all of this material. This is yours, okay? It's not us telling you, hey, this is how you should think. It's you reading this, going through the book, and where you will find the book is on our website, familiesimpactedbyopioids.com, and it's a download, and uh, it's about, oh, 350 pages, so you may want to just print those particular exercises as you come upon them and leave the rest kind of on the computer uh, as opposed to trying to print it out. I, I printed it out for my benefit, and it wasn't too bad, double-sided, but um, and, and then I took, like, the Avery tab system, 10 tabs, and tabbed each chapter by just dividing it that way. So now that you're all set up and we're taking a look at this part of the process of learning, uh, we're still at chapter one and I'm going to act like you've got this in front of you. So don't worry if you're driving, you can always come back to this podcast, put this document in front of yourself and replay it so that it's oriented towards the pages that I'm looking at that I'm talking about. Uh, in this case, we're talking about a very important topic of my personality. And we can start to say, well, Roy, why would we, I mean, this is re-entry. You know, we've got to get ID cards. We've got Maslow hierarchy needs. We need transportation, food, employment, all these other things. Why would we spend time on identifying uh, my personality? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny because you asked me the same question on values and beliefs, needs, wants, and goals. But the fact is, these are the foundational aspects of you understanding who you are. It's going to be extremely helpful to do this level of work based on what we know you're going to have to go through. Let's face it, it's really important for you to know who you are. And that sounds kind of like flaky, but if you know who you are, it's going to be more easy for you to develop what it is you need and how it fits into what you want to become and do and, and how you want to share who you are with others. That, that self-awareness is, is very important. So let's, let's take a look at you know, different types of personalities before we necessarily define yourself. And, and that, that comes down to kind of two types, not, not in an absolute, but two types being, uh, you're either an introvert, and none of these are bad, these are just who you are, or you're an extrovert. And, and for an introvert, you're, you're, you're more or less a, a, a person who looks at life from um, who you are and what things happen with you that are you. 
And then an extrovert is looking at who you are and how you kind of share and participate with who you are outside of yourself. So introversion preferences, you know, there are basically eight types of preferences used in, 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 in the different types of uh, personality indicators. These, these preferences mostly are used uh, because uh, they're most easily identified. Or, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to take this material that has to be a psych major to, to understand it. You, we want to simplify it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at about 20 questions. And I'm on page 33, by the way, uh, when you're looking at this as uh, the manual uh, presents to you. And, and the first, we're going to say yes or no. So literally you could do this. It would just be hard to record it. Um, but it, yes and no in your mind. And um, if it's a yes, then you put your uh, a Y next to that number. And you'll see in the scoring how that helps you to then come up with a score. And then what's the score tell you about yourself, introverted or extroverted? So do you, do you get energized by ideas? Yes, no. Do you enjoy social gatherings? but need personal time to be recharged, yes or no? Do you get energized by being alone, yes or no? Do you enjoy things better while listening to music on headphones, yes or no? Do you like going for a run, yes or no? Do you like individual one-on-one -on -one activities, yes or no? Do you think before you act, yes or no? Number eight, do you want to understand you, Yes or no? Number nine, do you usually share your most inner thoughts? Yes or no? Number 10, do you consider ideas before discussing them? Yes or no? Number 11, do you consider yourself private? Yes or no? Do you think on the fly? Yes or no? Do you get energized by other people and things? Yes or no? Do you like variety and action? Yes or no? Do you speak loudly? Yes or no. Do you act before you think? Yes or no. Do you get easily distracted? Yes or no. 18. Do you act on impulse? Yes or no. 19. Do you express yourself openly with others? Yes or no. 20, which is the last one. Do you regularly say what you're thinking? Yes or no. So what this key then asks you to do is to count the numbers of yeses from the questions one to 10. And let's say, so from do you get energized and 10 was, do you consider ideas before discussing them? Uh, those questions there, how many were, were marked yeses? And then you put that total number. And then count the number of whys from the questions 11 to 20. And then do the same that you did before. Uh, the number of Ys totaled would be indicated next to that question. If you have more Ys from 1 to 10, then you identify with extroversion personality. Intro excuse me, introversion personality. If you have more Ys from 10 to 20, then you identify with extroversion personality. Introversion motto, ready, aim, aim. Extroversion, mo extroversion motto, ready, fire, aim. Can you kind of see where the, um, the structure of, of this, like these questions took us? Well, let's just look back on some of these, give it a little air. Um, do you get energized by being alone? Well, I mean, really, isn't that kind of a person who's more introverted? And that, that doesn't mean negative, this is just their style. Um, I, would, I would suggest, for me personally, my opinion would be yes. Do, do, you want, do you want to understand you? Well, that's usually an introverted person. They, they, they truly want to understand themselves. Um, and then when you start to look at the other aspects, do you speak loudly? Do you act before you think? I got to tell you, I do, you know, but in some cases, um, thinking too much on something for too long 
it could be a detriment too. I'm just I'm just trying to defend myself. I almost think like an extrovert is kind of like that really obnoxious, out of control person who just goes rambling on. Oh gosh, I just kind of described myself there too. I better be careful here. But anyhow, with with and what I'm trying to suggest is don't don't beat yourself up or think you need to make yourself different. Oh, I want to be an introvert. You know, if you're not an introvert, you're not an introvert. And I you know, I don't know the value of of trying to change that in terms of, you know, what you might think would, would help you to do that. So the fact is now, um, by the way, just because you did not ask, um, I'm an extrovert and, and I'm okay with that. Um, now, the next question uh, is on page 34 and that's, are you right brained or left brain? And, and somebody who's listening is probably sitting there saying, this is nuts, Roy, who cares? Well, th these things all have a reason. A lot of very intelligent people put this sequence of learning together because, believe it or not, this builds on your beliefs. This builds on your values. This builds on how well you could accomplish goals. You, you need to, you, you would, not you need, but it would benefit you if you kind of knew a little bit about, am I an introvert, an extrovert? Am I left brain, am I right brain? So let's talk. Do you, do you know what, the, that the brain has two halves. The left side of the brain control, uh, controls the right side of the, the body. The right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. The two halves are connected by a system of fibers called corpus callosum. And, and, and in 1940, some doctors cut the corpus callosum of patients uh, with epilepsy. And, and they wanted to see uh, if, if this would like trap patients' seizures, trap their seizures, stop them, and, and one side of the brain, uh, so the other side of the brain could function normally, kind of like let's, let's not let it influence the other side of the brain and, and see if the other side of the brain can, can do well. And then in 1960, a scientist named uh, Roger Sperry studied patients who had been through this operation. He noticed some interesting things about them. Uh, he, his split-brained patients could hold an object in their right hand and name it. But they held the same object in their left hand. They could describe it, but they couldn't name it. Well, that's, that's interesting. And that's because, you know, it takes the whole brain to be able to complement the other sides of, 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 of the brain. So... What Sperry's studies seem to show is that half of the brain has different characteristics and abilities. The left is logical. Left is logical, analytical, and used for verbal skills. The right half sees things kind of as a whole instead of in its parts. So it's not really using more logical, deeper thinking. It's, it's more or less accepting what it's seeing. Now, people talk about being right brain and left brain all the time. Uh, the latest thinking research puts the focus on the whole brain. So when we're talking about, you know, are you left brain, right brain, you know, think about how your brain functions. It can tell us more about your personality style, okay? So let, let, let's take a look at, you know, where we might be with the idea of right brain, left brain. Trust me, there's, there's a purpose to doing this exercise. It's not like we're getting off on a tangent that we don't need to go towards. So here, here are about uh, 10 questions on page 35. And um, it, it continues on, on 36 with uh, taking you from 11 to 20. So in total, there'll be 20 questions. There's an A and a B. Circle A or B for the answer you would most likely choose. So I'm going to state it, ask a question, and then I'll tell you what A and B is, and then you decide which of those two apply to your answer for that question. One through 20, here we go. Which is truer for you? I worry about getting things done right. A, I am relaxed and I let things happen. B, next question two. Do you often feel sad and down? No, A, yes, B. Question three. Which do you enjoy more about music? The beat, A, the lyrics, B. 
Question number four. Which way of learning do you like best? Books and lectures, A. Workshops and field trips, B. Kind of see where this is going? Question number five. Which of these two subjects do you like more? Math, A. Art, B. Question six. Which of these two games do you prefer? Scrabble, A. Checkers, B. How do you usually buy some things? I think, uh, this is question seven, I think about its value and how I will use it. A, I just buy it. B, question number eight. When you buy something, do you make sure to get the correct change back? I gotta, I gotta tell you, I really don't always do that. I know that's silly. Um, so question number eight, when you buy thing, something, do you make sure to get the correct change back? Yes, I count it. A. No, I usually just put it in my pocket. B. How do you figure things out? Question number nine. One piece at a time. Then I put it all together. A. How do you, this is question number nine. How do you figure things out? The answer comes to me all at once, like a light goes on, which is B. Question number 10. Which of these two types of puzzles do you prefer? Crossword. A. Jigsaw. B. Question number 11. And I'm on page 36 now. How do you have a hunch? Question number 11. Never. Almost never. A. Often. B. <coughs> Excuse me. Which would you rather do? Question number 12, read, A, watch TV, B. Question number 13, how are you at putting your feelings into words? Very good, A, it's hard for me, B. If you practice a sport or musical instrument, how do you do it? Question number 14, <clears throat> the same time each day for a certain amount of time, A, when I feel like it and have the time, B. Question number 15. If you are going somewhere that you have never been, which method do you use to find your way? Well, I just use Google. No, just kidding. Question, answer, um, I ask the, for directions, then write down the street names and landmarks. A, I ask for the address, then I look at a map. B. <clears throat> Which of these types of fabrics do you prefer? Answer, A, fabric without much texture, cotton and denim. Or B, fabrics with lots of texture, corduroy, suede, velvet. Question number 17. You are good at remembering faces. No. A, yes. B, question number 18. You are good at remembering names. Yes, A, no, B. Question number 19. How do you feel about psychic claims or ESP, for example? They're foolish and not scientific. A, they're worth looking into. B, the final question, number 20. Are you better athlete, are you a better athlete then you are a student. No. A. Yes. B. Hmm. Okay. Well, those were some interesting questions. We're going to turn to page uh, 37. And um, if, if you, if you said a total of all my A's is greater than a total of all my B's, then you're left brain. If you said a total of all my B's is greater than a total of all my A's, then you're right brain. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. So now we know a little bit about our personality style, a type, introverted, extroverted. And now we know that we're uh, more leaning towards right brain or left brain. 15 or more A's or B's means strong preference to that side of the brain. 12 to 14 A's or B's 
means you have some preference for the side, that side of the brain. And 9, 10, or 11 means you use both sides of your brain equally. So what that, that is telling you is um, the, in these particular totals, you know, where, where, would, where would you find yourself? So and there, and there's some other new ways that, you know, you can determine left brain, right brain. Um, clasp your hands together. Which thumb is on top? You know, when I just did that right now, although you can't see it, because uh, this is probably audio for you, but for those of you that um, have the video as well as audio, like, like on the YouTube channel, um, my, my left hand just crossed over my right. Interesting. Fold your arms. Which one's on top? Well, oddly enough, my right is over my left. Cross your legs. Which one's on top? My right. Although you can't see it. My, my right, I naturally would put over my left leg. Make a circle with your hand and hold it to your eye and look through the circle. Which hand did you use? I used my right. Which eye did you use? Um, I used my right. Stand on one, I won't do this, <laughs> you can. Stand on one leg, which leg did you stand on? I, I, would, I would have used my, uh, my left leg. What side of your brain is in control? Well, uh, you know, according to this, it seems like I, I lean towards right most often. Okay, so I'm right brain. And uh, that, that is going to, in looking back, you know, tell me a little bit more. Let's go back to page 34 and, and say the right side of your brain controls the left side of the brain. And the two has connected the system. And, and then what we start to see is that we already know that the, uh, the, the right side of the brain um, is, is more on the, um, you know, the, the, the whole. It looks more towards everything, whereas the left side of the brain is more logical. And, um, and, and I think that, that, oddly enough for me personally, uh, that would hold true. Um, Although I do use logic a lot, it seems, especially uh, as the uh, founder and director of uh, Families Impacted by Opioids, because I, I kind of have to um, guide myself towards um, what are you dealing with, okay? And then look into the science papers to determine what, what's going to benefit you the most to know, and, and then put that into kind of a learning uh, sequence, which is what we're doing with fentanyl and families in harm's way and the 32 uh, key issues that you'll have to face and then all the pipers and, 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 and um, best practices uh, that we've shown you as family members. Uh, this is exactly uh, some of the ways that the industry is asking for you to consider uh, as part of your knowledge base. So um, kind of like have to think logically to do that is what I'm suggesting. So it's not like you're never logical if you're right side brain is what I'm saying. Uh, so now we're on exercise uh, number 19, and, and, and this is, uh, these are optional exercises. Um, and, and there's uh, 19 goes on for about 45, 68, oh, 90 questions. And, um, then, it, then it has a, uh, a breakdown with um, a banner at the top on page 42 that says, okay, this if you fill out and you follow the instructions, this is going to identify for you um, what what kind of you know personality would, would be uh, would best describe you know who you who you really are, and um, and it, and in that you know we're looking at it's kind of a if you're familiar with Briggs Myers um, personality testing, this is kind of a simplified version of, of that. So here we're kind of like determining, are you artistic? Are you social? By your personality styles, not by your activities. Are you energetic? Are you conventional? Um, and, 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 you know, are you realistic? Are you investigative? And you might sit there and think, well, yeah, these are really kind of interesting things to know about ourselves. 
Yeah, they are, but they're more than that. I mean, this is almost, if you really want to know why you desire something, uh, why you succeed in goals, and, and, and how you apply your values and your beliefs, your personality style is truly going to help like drive some of that. Not guaranteed, but it helps to drive some of that. So understanding that, um, and I took this test uh, two nights ago. I was very pleased with how easy it was to take it, so I encourage you to do the same. But with that in, that in mind, um, I, I had to agree with the final outcome, and, and it's just surprising. I shouldn't be surprised because some very intelligent people thought this up. Um, how, how I can now use that. But it did, it did identify myself as being social, which I truly am. And I don't want to fight that. Um, you know, some people might say, oh, I'd rather be more analytical, Roy. You can make more money if you're analytical because then you can get a finance job and blah, 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 blah. No, this is for you to understand yourself and accept yourself for who you are. And, um, and for that reason, I, I also identified me as being um, a, kind of like a second to social, uh, energetic, and, and then and in some ways investigative. And I thought, well, I, I'm going to run with that. Okay, um, I'm okay with those. They're not labels, but I'm okay with that kind of analysis being done because I, I really do think that it's accurate. So who am I? Well, okay, if I were to kind of go back and you know take a look at this, it, it looks like um, I'm an extrovert. Um, I'm right-brained. and I see things more in the whole, and I'm less... I'm less inclined to be logical and, and you know, reasoning things out. Um, and I know that always sounds like, oh, boy, well, I kind of want to be logical. No, you know, I can accept that, you know, because there's a lot of value to being able to see things as a whole because you can, you know, understand goals and outcomes and you can visualize, you know, where it is that you're going, you know, more, more clearly, I believe, as whole because I can always break down a whole later if I need to. Um, depending on how my, my, my map is kind of like my inner map is set up. And then, you know, my personality, which is like, okay, how, how do I complement? How do I take this stuff forward? Well, with my personality type. Um, so I'm social. Okay, so what you have here is a man that is um, an extrovert, and um, he's usually able to think on larger, you know, like whole pieces and um, he's uh, social and he's energetic and he's investigative. Okay. <laughs> well, that's kind of cool. Right. But, it, but we're not doing this because we want to be like kind of like in the know. But there's a certain settling of who I am. Because when you're in reentry, it typically means you gave up something from where you're coming out of. When, when you're in prison and you're incarcerated, uh, in any kind of incar incarceration, yourself is often taken um, away. Not on purpose, but in some cases we have to suppress ourselves. Let's face it, if you're living in a, uh, you know, a cell uh, in general population, and there's you know 60 people in that one large area of space, and you're in these you know bunk beds. You're very vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable, and everybody is in your life. Everybody is in you, so it may benefit you, and it often does, to create a incarceration you in order to survive. But it's not really you. It's what you're doing in order to get through what it is that you're dealing with. We do the same thing in trauma. In order to get through the trauma, we might fabricate a certain type of person that isn't necessarily us. But when we get to the other side, we can detach ourselves from that because it never really was us. We just use that in order to get through the situation we were in. It may be as a family member dealing with a loved one that has addictions and substance use disorders as a brain disease. 
your ability to cope with that as a member of the family might be that you take on a different persona, a different type of personality. Not really even, in some cases, knowing that that's what you're doing. And then later to find when things start to settle, you're still holding on to that. Can you kind of see that that might be a problem? It might be that now you need to let go of that. And that's what trauma family therapy, stress family therapy helps you to see. That you know you, you created something in order to survive it, but now because it's still there, you haven't decoupled from it, kind of like train, car trains, you know, where they have that coupler and it hooks onto the, uh, the, the one that's in front of it and hooks onto the one that's in back of it. Well, you need to decouple that because that one box car is not needed and it might be contaminated and affecting the rest of the cars in your train, you know, in your person. And so um, a family therapist can help you to do that. So knowing a little bit about yourself helps you to more easily say, that's not me. I mean, that wasn't me before Billy started to just smoke crack. And uh, I had to become that in order to help Billy, help my family, help me uh, get through all this trauma. I mean, bad things just kept happening one after the other. And uh, now that those things aren't happening and, and Billy's in recovery, I need to kind of go back to who I am. But because these things have happened to me, they're now kind of a part of me. So maybe it's not that I'm going to go back to who I was, but now I need to go back, or not even go back, but define who I am now, let go of those other pieces that were just specific for surviving that situation, but more clearly identify who am I now that I've been through this trauma with Billy as a member of the family, now that I've been through prison, surviving, you know, being in a incarceration in a cell environment with, with other people who definitely are not taking time to think about who they are. They're just doing the same thing with whatever coping skills they happen to have. And that's anybody's guess, depending on where they came from before they were incarcerated. So you can kind of see, or if you're in a mental health institution, or in some cases you were in a medical situation that you know confined you to a bed or because your health had to improve or you broke something and, and it needed time to mend and you had to kind of like take on this new person, like-ish, still was you, but like-ish. And now that, that's not needed anymore. And now it's starting to get in the way because your way of thinking back then doesn't really help you to think that way now about the things you're facing now. Reentry is about throwing out the trash, but don't throw out yourself with it. You've heard the phrase, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, just throw the bathwater out. Keep the baby. So with that in mind, we want to make sure that um, we understand ourselves so we can embrace exactly who that is as we move forward. And now we're going to start to gather things that, you know, from a goal standpoint, make sense to us. And that sometimes uh, means we're going to have to learn. And being in the position of learning, now we start to say to ourselves, so if, if I'm going to learn, um, how do I understand learning? I mean, given that we're getting this microcosm, you know, review of things, uh, what, what do I need to know about myself in regards to, oddly enough, my learning style, you know? So now you're looking at kind of a, so how, how do I learn? I mean, in terms of what are the best ways of learning for me personally? Because now I'm going forward and I'm, I'm identifying myself of my values, my beliefs um, that were before this all happened to me. But now I have the advantage of going through all this strife. And actually, parts of that challenged me in ways that I want to hold on to. I mean, I was actually to prove that I'm a stronger person than I realized I was. I don't want to let that go. Um, I, I learned things about myself and the trauma and, you know, maybe how to practice my faith better, how to come to God and let God you know, do for me and not feel that I have to do it all myself. 
that there is a higher being and and I want that to, going forward. I don't want to just throw that out. So with that in mind, knowing who you are is really, really important. And I hope that this episode helps you to, to see that. But now let's just take a, a moment and look at, you know, wh what ways benefit us most in terms of our learning style. And we're on page um, uh, 47. So if, if, if you... If you want to uh, take a look at your learning style, you know, then, then complete the learning style inventory. Uh, we're going to actually take an inventory of your learning style and then we'll interpret it. So the, a sample is, um, read the statement carefully and circle yes if it describes you. Circle no if it does not describe you. So there's a question and then there's a column that says yeses and then there's a column that says no's. And when you're on page 48, you'll see what I'm talking about. But the sample is, I'd rather get things done in the afternoon than in the morning, yes or no. A yes response means that you prefer the afternoon. A no response means that you prefer morning. There is no right or wrong response, only the way that you think or feel about the statement. And the statements are purposeful, okay? Now, um, you know, Kind of unfortunately, there's 45 of them. Yep, I'm going to go through them, but I'm going to go through them quickly so that we can get to the other end. And there is a scoring tool on page 51 that kind of accumulates, you know, your response. Because this is important for you to know. How, in what ways do I learn best? And, and then, um, then it actually takes your uh, learning style inventory and kind of like defines it visually, auditorily, meaning you hear it, tactile. Tactile means, it's kind of a cool term. When I first saw tactile, I thought, wow, what a great word. But tactile means you, you touch it, okay? It's something that you experience from touching. It's You learn better by, you know, operating the machinery than necessarily being shown or being told how to operate the machinery. So um, then that's called a receptive style. And, and then how are you scale then in social style? You know, do you do better in individual learning or group learning? That's important for you to know going forward. Remember, all this is right now, you're at this stage of, I'm holding on to some of the things that happened while I was in incarceration as part of reentry. And I'm throwing out a whole bunch of other stuff. But because I know myself more clearly, I know my values and beliefs, I know what I, my needs, wants, and desires, because I've gone through those exercises. I know not to throw out those things, okay, because I've identified what they are. And those things are good, and they are who I am, and I want to make sure I hold on to that identity. So now we're looking at uh, an inventory of the way that you learn going forward, because now you're going to take who you are, and you're going to add to it by learning the right things as part of your reentry. And then expressive style. Um, you know, uh, do you express yourself better in writing? I, I, I was with a gentleman the other day that said, I wrote down a mission statement. And Stephen Covey gets into this too in uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, his book. And what, what is identified is you write down your mission statement and then you come back to it. Sometimes they say, uh, put it in an envelope and mail it to yourself and then when it comes, read it. You'd be surprised at what you put down in that mission statement having written it as opposed to having stated it out loud and heard yourself saying it. Okay, so let's get going. Learning style. We're going to go through 40, so bear with me. Uh, make Number one, make props. Flashcards help me to learn. Yes, no. I can write about things that I know better than I can tell them. Yes or no. When I really want to understand what I have read, I read softly to myself. Yes or no. I get more done when I am alone. Yes or no. Number five, I remember what I have read better than what I have heard, yes or no? Six, when I answer a question, I can say the answer better than I can write it, yes or no? Seven, when I do math problems in my head, I say the numbers to myself, yes or no? Eight, I enjoy joining in on discussions, yes or no? I, number nine, I understand a math problem that is written down better than one that I heard, yes or no. I do better than what I 
can write the an when I can write the answer instead of having to say it, yes or no. Number eleven, I understand spoken directions better than written ones, yes or no. Number twelve, I like to work by myself, yes or no. Number thirteen, I would rather read a story than listen to one, yes or no. Number fourteen. I would rather explain how things work than write them out about how it, how it works, yes or no. Number 15, someone tells me three numbers to add. I can usually get the right answer without writing them down, yes or no. 16, I prefer to work with a group when there is work to be done, yes or no. 17, seeing a graph or chart of numbers is easier for me to understand than hearing the numbers said, yes or no. 18, spelling a word several times helps me to remember it better, yes or no. 19, I learn better if someone reads a book to me than if I silently read to myself, yes or no. 20, okay, we're halfway through. I learn best when I study alone, yes or no. 21. When I have a choice between reading and listening, I usually read, yes or no. 22, I'd rather tell a story than write it, yes or no. 23, saying the multiplication tables over and over helps me remember them more than writing them down over and over, yes or no. 24, I do best work in a group. 25, I understand a math problem that is written down better than one I hear. 26, a group project, I would, in a group project, I would rather make a chart or poster than gather the information to put in it. 27, written assignments are easy for me to follow. 28, I remember more of what I learn if I learn it alone. 29, I do well in classes where most of the information has been read to me. 30, I would enjoy giving an oral report to the class. 31, I learn math better from spoken explanations than, one, than written ones. 32, if I had to decide something, I ask people for their opinion. 23, excuse me, 33, Written math problems are easier for me to do than oral ones. 34, when learning like, I like to use my hands. 35, I don't mind doing written assignments. 36, I remember things I hear better than things I read. 37, I learn better by reading than by listening. 38, it's easy for me to tell about the things that I know. 39, it makes it easier when I say the numbers of a problem to myself as I work it out. 40, if I understand a problem, I like to help someone else understand it too. 41, seeing a number makes more sense to me than hearing a number. 42, I better understand what I have learned if I am involved in making something for the subject. 43, the things I write on paper sound better when I say them. 44, I, have it easier to I find it easier to remember what I have heard than what I have read. 45, final, final question, it is fun to learn with classmates but it is hard to study with them. Okay, I realize that that was a long list, but I mean, you're now going to take your scores and you're going to write in, like in the visual column, they have, if you answer number five, a yes or a no, number nine, 13, 17, 21, 25, 27, 29, 37, and 41, okay? So if in the columns below you put an X in front of the number, if you answered yes to that question, if you answered no to the question, 
do not make a mark by that number. So under visual, for these specific questions, num the numbered questions, if you said yes to number five, you would put an X. So then you count up, you know, after you do auditory, tactile, individual, group, oral, or written, and, and you'll end up with uh, what is your learning style. But that, that doesn't really tell you an awful lot, you know. So they take you over to visual, audio, auditory, tactile, individual, group, oral, and written, and they have you chart out your number, and you kind of fill it in and scratch it and fill it in kind of like you would with a Crayola. And you'll see a, a visual graph of what areas uh, are, are your, is your learning style, receptive style, social style, or expressive style. And, and, and now, you know, you, you can then have a better understanding of, so when I go to learn, you know, what, what works best for me? So if somebody sits there and says, well, we're going to put you in a class where, you know, um, it's all hands-on, there's no books, and um, you'll read and then you'll do. And you turn around and you say, oh, wait a second. <laughs> That's not going to work for me, you know, because... Um, I'm more auditorial and, and individual, and you're putting me in a group, and you're making me use tactile and group. And uh, for that reason, this probably isn't the best style of learning for me. And um, I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to see if maybe you have something because of my learning style is more, more enhanced. When I see it and I'm in a group, and it's more oral than written. You know, that's, that's how I learn best. Trust me, when you're in the situation of re-entry, regardless of what you're re-entering for, and you have an understanding of who you are, you've got a lot of learning in front of you. There's a lot of learning. And by having this as your guidepost is really a benefit for you. So I'm so glad that, that you're, you know, you're taking this and you'll see on page 54, what is a visual style? And you'll see on 55, what is an auditory style? And you'll see on uh, 56, what is a tactile? And, and kensiathetic, kensia meaning action, you know, you're touching or pushing. So, your learning styles, you know, circles, we're, we're on page 57. Circle the, uh, this is an exercise, Circle the one that uh, your preference most, your learning style. I, I learn best by seeing, hearing, or doing. Which is it? And, and just, just so you know, there's only seven of these questions. Um, I, I learn best by uh, I can look things up or I can ask someone who knows. Uh, position. I learn best by sitting in front of a TV, by being propped up by pillows on my bed, and sitting by my, at my desk, okay? Uh, people, I learn best by myself. I learn best by with one person, or I learn best by a group. Really important for you to know this. I mean, if you don't learn best by being by yourself, then don't put yourself in that situation as thinking, well, this is the best way for me to learn. We've already determined, you've already determined by doing this exercise, it's not. So be true to yourself and, and get a group together or, you know, get one other person together. In, in question number four, you've identified that about yourself. That's the value of taking these exercises is that you can identify, you know, what's going to be in your best interest. This is all about building a better you up on in reentry. Hey, this is really cool when you think about it because what we're doing with you is through these, uh, these episodes on reentry, we're going to build a better you. I'm telling you, we can build a really strong you by you doing these things and really putting yourself into it and owning this material. Let's continue because there were seven. Time. I learn best in the morning. I learn best in the afternoon. I learn best at night. Please, give me a break. That's really important for you to know. Me personally, I do all my scientific papers and, and all of my, like, deeper thinking at around eh, anywhere from like seven in the morning to you know 11 in the morning 
You catch me in the afternoon at around three, it better be social, meaning social styles, not, so, not like we're going out doing social things. Because um, I, I'm going to be much more auditory and, and oral than I am going to be reading and writing. That was in the morning. That's the morning me. <laughs> you know, before my coffee and after my coffee. So um, number six is sound. I learn best when there's background noise, music in the noise, and I, I learn best when it's quiet. You know, for me personally, that depends on what I'm dealing with. If it's really requiring a lot of logic and thinking, I don't want something in the background. But I do put on classical music in my house as a kind of a white noise thing. Um, I just enjoy it. I use my Alexa, and uh, fortunately I said that word, and there isn't one in here. Otherwise, I'd have to listen to her talking to me now. Um, so for that in, in mind, I do, I do um, do good depending on what it is that I'm doing whether I have music or something, or whether it's quiet. But I know that about myself. I want you to know that about yourself. I want to stack all the cards in your advantage by doing these exercises. The last one is motion. I learn best sitting still. I learn best with uh, some movement. That's for you to decide. I think it's depending on what I'm learning, you know. Uh, I played a lot of ice hockey when I was younger. And um, I think that that... That whole like idea of of moving puck, you know, uh, I was a, I was I was actually very good uh, defenseman, and um, taking taking true ownership of my learning. I can't remember a time when I took a book out to learn how to shoot a puck, you know, or or how to do a hip check or you know push somebody into the boards so that you know you can take control of the puck and and leave them behind, uh, and and so. That was that was never th that. It was all visual, a coach telling me and me doing. See what I'm saying? So I want to thank you for taking the time for us to go through this. I know it's a lot of work, but it, it's work that's worth doing. We're going to build a better you. One chapter, one exercise at a time. And I just feel like I really feel privileged to be able to sit down with you and to, and to do this level of work with you on your re-entry. Come on now. You're a good person or you wouldn't be taking these materials. You wouldn't be spending the time. You're obviously, if you're in this forum with me, you're obviously somebody who wants to you know, get a better resolve. And the, the beauty of this is it's going to make it easier for people to share the, the person that you are now going forward. And because you've taken the work to kind of like scrape a rake through and pick up these leaves that don't belong on a lawn of who you were back and what you were doing um, so that you can help them to see the greener grass of who you really are. And the only reason you can do that is because you've personally taken the time to know who you are, that you can then represent that to others. It'll be clearer, it'll be truer, and it'll be something that they can really appreciate the fact that you valued yourself enough to understand yourself. I want to thank you very much for your time and for in, uh, in being involved in the voice of families and addiction in this episode. Stand up for yourself and I'll back you up because problems don't solve themselves. I'll tell you what, instead of would or could, I think you should draw a line in the sand and stand your ground. It's for your own good.